So Tom, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Tom Manevitz is a professor of political science at Chemnitz University of Technology and he's an expert on political extremism. And uh, we will talk today for a little while about uh, the rise of uh, right-wing populism in Europe and specifically in Germany. So Tom, uh, my first question would be, uh, given the fact that liberal democracies are pluralistic regimes, that meaning that uh, liberal democracies uh, open a space for uh, articulating uh, different ideas and uh, are proud of themselves as being pluralistic regimes, so to speak. Uh, but we find that at the same time, uh, liberal democracies are becoming increasingly aware or maybe sensitive about ideas that do not respect pluralism, so to speak. Now, my first question would be, in that respect, do you think that uh, liberal democracy is meant to be intolerant with the intolerance? Or do you think that it's better for democracy to, uh, well, accept that in the public sphere we have this radical view, so to yeah, speak? Yeah. Well, if democracy is taken seriously with all its um, fundamental views of liberal, uh, liberal, uh, liberalism and pluralism and tolerance, if you take it seriously, then actually democracy is, democracy's fate is to accept all views. And to accept all views means to accept even views that intend to abolish democracy. If the idea of democracy itself is taken by word, but the question is, is the democracy meant to accept all, point of views, all points of views? Or should democracy have the right to defend itself? No matter which measures must be taken in order to defend itself. And if you accept the, uh, the premise that democracy has a right to defend itself, has a right to defend pluralism, to defend individual rights, uh, participation rights, and so on, you can go to the uh, second step and ask yourself what is necessary to, to protect that. And the answer to that question is actually the institutionalization of militant democracy. And the, the, the principle of militant democracy is that democracy has the right to be intolerant of the intolerant, um, but that doesn't solve the dilemma of the fact that democracy itself will take authoritarian measures, illiberal measures, to protect a larger body of principles and values. That's a dilemma you can't solve, but it's a dilemma you can accept in order to preserve democracy. Thank you. Uh, now, I guess like the next question would be, uh, do you really think that today's populistic parties, especially right-wing populistic parties in Eastern Europe and uh, Germany, are a real threat to democracy? Uh, or, I mean, has there been any change between traditional far-right parties and new right-wing populistic parties? I think uh, in the last years we could witness a change in that party family. If you just grasp the party family of the radical right or far-right or whatever, there's been a change, there's been a fundamental change, I think. But in a way that the, the successful parties today are those that are more moderate, or at least pretend to be more moderate, pretend to be pro-democratic, pretend to, to defend the values of the West, uh, of Christianity, for example, and, and pluralism as well. Um, but that doesn't mean they, they are now, there are no threats to democracy. See, when we talk about the old far right, like uh, Front National, for example, uh, which is like the, uh, the perfect example of the old far right, we could perfectly see that like in the 80s and the 1990s when uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen was the leader of that party, um, that the values it defended and the principles it fought for, even the, the pure language of the party leaders was in conflict with the values of democracy. It was easier, easier to, to grasp their anti-democratism. Um, and this party family, taking the uh, Front National as the um, prime example of that old party family, has somewhat changed. And that's a fact we can also see with the Front National as well, which not only changed its, its name, that's like a superficial uh, phenomenon, but with the, um, 
with the power taking procedure of uh, Marine Le Pen, managed to introduce the process of what she called the deboilization, de de the um, making the appeal of being moderate, being acceptable to a larger uh, votership, and to you know, to be more attractive to a larger body of, of people. What I don't know is, especially in the case of the Front National, Rassemblement National, or even in other parties like the AFD, is first of all, can we take it as, as granted what they say? Do they mean what they say? Or do they just like play a game of mimicry? I don't know. Um, I think that depends from party to party. On the other side, if we take it uh, seriously what they say and uh, even accept the fact that they we do not intend to, to attack democracy by its core values. Um, that doesn't mean there are no threats to democracy. I think the thing uh, the, the, is quite clear when we look at extremist parties, like in Germany, the old NPD or DVU or other far-right extremist, racist, anti-Semitic parties. That's quite clear. But when we look at the other parties, for example, even the AFD, and I'm not only talking about the, the far-right wing within the party, but the party itself as a, as a whole, um, it can also be a threat to democracy even if it's not anti-democratic because it's like the essence of populism, of especially right-wing populism, um, to attack the institutions of democracy, to undermine trust into the institutions of democracy, to undermine confidence in what politicians do. And of course, if you take them by word, they intend to improve democracy. No right-wing populist would ever say that it's a goal to to attack democracy and uh, to, to establish dictatorship. But the effect is that democracy is undermined, that, that democracy is destabilized, I think. And that's the more serious threat, I think, because with the old far right, it was easy to detect their anti-democratism. And with the new far right or the new radical right or right wing uh, populist parties, it's easier to detect the threat of democracy, but it's there and it's uh, existent, actually. Thank you. Uh, do you think that the, the success that uh, right-wing populism had on Eastern Europe uh, and even Eastern Germany has to do with the fact that these countries didn't maybe develop a democratic culture in the past uh, century? Yeah. Or uh, is it, does it have to do with uh, more, I don't know, economic reasons like delocalization in Eastern Europe, so yeah. to speak? All of it. All of it, I think. I think you cannot... Um, trace the, the rise of right-wing populism or the far right, generally speaking, trace it back only to economic factors or only to like cultural heritage or to uh, the past of the last decades. It's a mixture of all that and that makes it so difficult. Because <clears throat> you see, when the 1990s we had this <clears throat> dilemma of simultaneity, meaning that these societies uh, has, have undergone at least three transformations, political, um, social and economic being a huge challenge not only to the political system itself, but democracy and the society itself. That's the first aspect. Also taking into account the past of like 40 or even 50, 60, 70, 80 years of a dictatorship that has left its, its legacy in the minds of the people. Um, being the second one and the third one, of course, the, the development, the economic development after after 1990 and the 1990s itself, uh, themselves or even the early 2000s. And I think it's a mixture of all that. Um, you just have to make these, uh, um, these, these contrafactual mind games, just taking one of that factors away um, that would, in my eyes, uh, have made it a lot more difficult for radical right parties to succeed. If you just took away the authoritarian past, it would have been much more difficult for that parties to succeed if you take away uh, the economic crises uh, they've gone through, it would have been much more easy for them. And at least it's the fact that um, communism was quite successful over decades, uh, quite successful in suppressing ethnic conflicts within their countries. Uh, not least, not only by uh, suppression, uh, but also by the other ideology that served as like a fixing point, like a reference point for ethnics in the, within the states and that just from one day to another just dropped or, or has split. And yeah, I think that's the, the mixture of that, that difficult legacy in political terms, like the, ethnic, um, uh, the ethnic quality of that, of that people 
and uh, the economic challenges we've been facing. I think it's a mix, uh, the mixture of that. For example, when we take about the, talk about the far right in, in Eastern Europe, it's far, far, far more difficult to identify that parties because when you look at the, the literature, the empirical, empirical literature, uh, parties we would actually deem as far right parties are every now and then uh, qualified as far left parties due to the fact that they combine uh, ideological um, fragments from both wings and that's absolutely incomparable to the far right we've been watching in, in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. Now do you think like uh, the success of the AA AFD for example in Eastern Germany and the difference between uh, the popularity of uh, right-wing populism in Eastern and Western Germany is bringing some, somehow bringing back the idea that we have two different Germanys. I mean, is, is, is the success of populism in Eastern Germany producing in West Germany this idea that yeah. there are still two Germanys that are very different from each other? Absolutely, absolutely. The problem is um, the success of the AFD is not a, a success story of the East or w just within the East. If you look at the electoral maps of like the, uh, um, uh, the Bundestag elections in 2017 or the European elections in 2019 in May, you see that, um, that the AFD is not strong everywhere in the East. That would be too, yeah. too, too plain. That's a plain and simple explanation that's, that actually never worked. But you see that uh, the, the party succeeds especially in the regions that are close to the borders to Poland and to, to Czechia, um, which in turn also doesn't mean that it's the, the relation to, to foreigners or whatever that caused the success of that party, but it's also the region, the countryside, you know? Mm. The people that feel left, uh, left far behind, the people that feel that they do not get what they deserve relative to privation, and that they're frustrated with politicians. Um, there are <coughs> also, Counter examples within the East uh, that it, that make the explanation uh, the explanation of an of an of blue <laughs> is kind of kind of nil. That's for example the big cities, um, and I'm not only talking about uh, talking about Berlin, but also Leipzig and Dresden, for example, and the regions surrounding them, the belts surrounding them. The problem is that we're not used to. Uh, we're not used to look on regions or look on aggregates below the east and the west dimension. The discussion in Germany is, has, is framed and always has been framed in, in terms of opposites. Mm. It's unity or difference between a, uh, between a pair. It's like either they get together uh, and will form a, a unified whole or they will, they will be split into two halves, east and west. Um, thereby ignoring or not getting the point at all that we are watching or they wit we are witnessing the process of heterogenization, fragmentation. And the fact that this is a neglect it expl explains why the success of the AFD in the East, which is not a success in the East, but in some parts of the East, is perceived as being an Eastern success. And that typically enforces the paradigm of the last years that the East is different, that the political culture is different. They're not uh, ripe, uh, ripe for, for democracy and all, all that, but it's um, not only false in my eyes, but also politically dangerous. Now, <clears throat> regarding this, uh, Germany was perceived as an exception in Europe in the way that uh, it, it took very long in Germany to have a, like a radical right-wing party, if you, if you feel like, uh, that was successful. Yeah. Now, what has made uh, uh, this kind of German exceptionalism yeah. end. Yeah. What do you th why do you think that Germany has finally uh, arrived to the club of, of countries yeah. in which there is a very strong uh, radical right-wing yeah. party? Well, actually, we've had uh, radical right parties in the, yeah. in the political system, and not only on the federal and state level, but also on the, on the general, on the national level, like the NPD, yeah. um, which has been quite successful uh, in the 1960s and almost got into the, uh, into the parliament with, I think, 4.5%. It was very close. Uh, we've had the uh, Republicana, and we've also had the, the DVU, Deutsche Volksunion. But none of that party even managed to, to establish. Uh, there was this, uh, this dictum of Franz Josef Strauss, the, the party leader of the CSU, that there will not be and there cannot be a party, a democratically legitimated party, to the right of the union, of the CDU-CSU. And that's been, that's been true for, for decades. And that's been, uh, that has been um, perceived as some kind of German exceptionalism, 
but in a good way, because the, uh, the perception was, or the idea was that uh, due to the German past, National Socialism and, the, and, and all that, uh, that trouble and this, the struggle that has gone uh, hand in hand with that, even in the aftermath, has kind of, has kind of been a vaccination for, for uh, right-wing um, ideology. Um, but now we're witnessing a party that's uh, quite with that ideology succeeded. Why could, why could that be? How could that be? Well, the AfD started, did not start with the, the program and the ideolo ideology it is standing for today. It started in 2013 as a um, market liberal, Eurosceptic professor's party. That's like what it's described as in Germany. And, uh, and two things happened afterwards. Um, internally, there's, there have been serious struggles about the, the power within the party um, fought out by, by different wings of that, of that party, with the market liberal one being the one to uh, to go away or to be to pushed out of that party. That was the first process and the, f uh, the second one was that we have been witnessing uh, in 2014, even more so in 2015 and 16, uh, what's, what's called the refugee crisis. And at the same time as the refugee crisis or the perception of the refugee crisis has gained ground in, in public sphere and in the public debates, the AFD has turned into a radical right party. It's quite difficult to disentangle if that party, that party uh, internal struggle has been affected by the, by the refugee crisis, I'm not quite sure if that's, I think that's a little bit easier, that's a little bit um, plain and simple, that, that explanation. But um, we don't have to talk, <laughs> ask for the, for the causes of that, but there were two processes. The party radicalized, whereas at the same time we've been watching that refugee crisis and the party managed to, whereas it has already been established, managed to, to take that window of opportunity in order to, to even yeah, flourish, actually. And just imagine if that, party, if that party started with the same program, with the same manifesto it has today. Mm. Just imagine if it started with the same program it has today in 2013. I'm totally convinced it wouldn't have not a, nothing of a chance. Mm. I think it would have gone uh, the, same, the same fate as the NPD did or the DVU. But it started as, an, as another party than it is today, and that like, made it really accept, acceptable for other parties to, to tolerate that new party. But now they're finding it difficult to, uh, to push it out of the political system. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the intertwined um, yeah, um, fibers of, of developments that uh, go parallel to, to each other that made it possible for the AFD to succeed. If it started differently, it would, it, it would have been vanished, I think. And if it started uh, with the program it had, and it changed its, uh, changed its politics, its, its policy, its program, and so on, and the refugee crisis didn't happen, happen it would have also been uh, not successful. So it's just the perfect interplay of internal and external uh, developments that made it possible for that party to, to succeed after 60 years or almost 70 years without such a party in the party system. So I guess another, another reason why uh, uh, they have uh, increased uh, their s the support on the population is because this Grosse Coalition, right? Because yeah. one of the main arguments of populism is that traditional mainstream parties do not differentiate themselves. They only differentiate uh, themselves in terms of uh, false questions, yeah. but in the real questions, they are the same. Yeah. So I guess just like having a government of the two main political alter alternatives have reinforced this discourse that they are the real alternative. Definitely, definitely. And in that way, the, the party name alternative it really is holds true. And uh, we can even go further and say that this is a pattern. Every time uh, great coalitions tend to establish, and not only as, a, as an exceptional solution for problematic um, political process, but as a, as a pattern and as a way of coping with politics, every time such coalitions or such uh, uh, trends develop, we see that radical right or even populist parties succeed. That's not only been in, in Germany that case, but also in, take it, for example, Austria or whatever. Whenever people get the impression that it doesn't matter which party they give their, their vote for, uh, the, the populists have, have it quite easy to, to, to succeed because they can present themselves as the real alternative, as someone who's speaking for them and who's not uh, corrupted and all that kind. And that's, that's actually a pattern for, for the success of, of populist parties. 
I see. So um, it, I guess like uh, populistic parties are not generally very successful when they, when they uh, gain power and when they enter the institutions, but they are really, really very successful in setting the agenda in public opinion, right? Uh, does the AFD have been successful in that? I mean, uh, is like the topics that uh, public, German public opinion is dealing with somehow determined by the agenda setting of the AFD yeah. or? I'm not quite sure if it was the agenda setting of the AFD itself, but the, just the political process and the, the challenges that have been posed by the refugee crisis. Um, but no matter what, um, the party definitely succeeded in moving the whole party system, and I'm not only talking about the coalition parties, SPD and CDU, but to move the whole party system to the right. See, um, Angela Merkel has, been, uh, has gained a lot of reputation, um, not, uh, not, uh, not least um, in, in, in the other European states, for, for accepting uh, refugees, for allowing them to stay here, and so on for quite a liberal attitude um, and a reputation she didn't get from her own voters, of course. But at the same time, we tend to forget that after what she's uh, said, we, we are schaffen das, we, we are able to do that. Uh, she's managed to, um, yeah, from, or in little steps, to move away from what she said and to uh, impose yeah, or to, to implement uh, a more and more, not intolerant, but a more and more or stricter um, policy, a uh, refugee policy, um, without explaining that publicly, of course, but that's, uh, that's an example of how the AFD managed to, to move the parties uh, away from where they are to the right. And that doesn't hold only true for the coalition parties, but also for the other opposition parties. Take, for example, or as a good example, uh, the left, Die Linke, uh, which has, uh, has been split in the last two or three years over the question of how to cope with the refugee crisis with one wing saying that we all have to accept them, uh, supporting Angela Merkel and even, even uh, cheering for her, and the other wing saying, um, no, that's quite unacceptable, um, because first of all, we are responsible for the voters here, and uh, not least, we have to, to keep in mind that it's the AFD who is like attracting all the voters that uh, um, used to be our voters. When you look at the, the successful areas of the AFD, especially in East Germany, it's the regions where formerly the, the Linke has been quite successful. And we know that pattern from France, for example, but like 20 years after, when the uh, Front National uh, uh, managed to attract voters from the PCF. And that's quite ex exactly what we can watch in, in Germany. And with the, uh, with the more refugee critical part of the, the Linke being, at, the, at least in my eyes, more accepted by the voters and the, and the basis, and the more internationalist, cosmopolitan um, part of the of the Linke being more attractive and more accepted by uh, um, party functionals on the medium level on the on the upper, uh, upper level. Yeah, I see a, a pattern there uh, in a way that obviously the Rassemblement National and uh, well the the old Nas uh, Front National has clearly also two families. Uh, first family is the old communist voters uh, who are. Uh, looking for a left-wing uh, policy or left-wing economy, uh, political economy, uh, but they obviously abandoned the, uh, the left because they thought the left has abandoned them because yeah. the left has uh, forgotten about the ideas of nation, for example, right? Yeah. But you also have these traditional middle higher class voters, which are slightly different because they would, they would prefer a liberal approach to economy, for instance. Yeah. Uh, do you see these two factions as clearly as in France, for example, in the AFD in Germany? Well, that's, um, that's quite difficult due to the fact that um, there are different fractions and different wings within that party. Um, and they, they overlap with that differentiation in socio-economical terms. Um, but not only that, but also having fractions that differ in social cultural ways. Um, if you just imagine it as an, as an axis, like we've known from, from Herbert Kitschelt, for example, um, we have the, the market liberal part within that party, uh, being like the, the, um, the remainder of what <laughs> has been the, the founder group of the, of the AFD in 2013. Um, like a market liberal party, Eurocritic party, and the, and the like. 
Um, at the same time, these are the parts of the party which are on the social cultural axis being more left, um, and even though they are on the socio economic level uh, axis more to the right. Um, we have that, uh, that faction. We have like the, uh, just how, how to, to well, what label would be appropriate, probably the, the conservative part within yeah. that party. Uh, the dis uh, just to, to cut a long way short, um, the disappointed CDU voter. Um, that's, um, I think, the, the smallest faction within, within that party. And also we have, we have uh, Der Flüge um, and uh, the far right wing within the AFD being um, socio-culturally uh, on, the, on the right side, clearly. And, and <laughs> so far right it couldn't be <laughs> any further. And socio-economically, I think, split. Um, because within that faction we have the, this typical welfare state advocates and we also have these market liberals. But in that faction this differentiation doesn't play the, the major role of to, to identify. Main, because yeah. culture like, um, is, is, uh, is covering everything else. Um, and that's the, that's the huge problem. We have like, this, this differentiation within that party. And of course we, we also see differences in the, in the typical voter of the AFD. But it's not so clearly as, um, as the factions within the party. The voters are quiet, uh, not homogeneous, yes, homo in a way homo homogeneous. Yeah. They are not split so much as the, maybe the voters of the Rassemblement National, um, be, uh, not least to, uh, due to the fact that the AfD has managed to, to transform itself from a party of the disappointed democratic, democracy critic, disappointed voter to a party that uh, stands for a broader, uh, a for, for broader strata of society, with uh, with having um, yeah, predominantly male voters, but also uh, medium class voters. Not, it's not only the the disappointed and the and the uh, precariat, as you as you may say, um, but it's managed to to unfold, hmm. and we're watching that as well. But the, I don't know which how I'm not into into the uh, French discussion of the of the Rassemblement National all too deep, but. Um, the, uh, in Germany, it's the fact that the, the factions within the AfD are really struggling hard to, to gain power within the party. So Tom, uh, do you think the AfD has reached its electoral peak? I mean, uh, is there a possibility they can widen their electoral basis a little bit more? I'm skeptic about that. Um, recent studies in like, the, the last two years have always or have found out and that has always been corroborated that the the potential of the AFD, the electoral potential, is somewhere between 20 and 30 percent um, in whole Germany. And now that we are watching the or, or analyzing the electoral results of the Landtag elections in 2019, but also the but also the Bundestag election, we see that the, the party is not all too far away from its maximum potential. And I'm quite sure that uh, yeah, at least in medium terms, it has uh, achieved its peak. Um, nonetheless, I do not think that the party will disappear. I think it will remain um, a constant player within the party system over the next years um, that has extremely uh, profited from the refugee crisis, which is the reason why it like, uh, went through, uh, <laughs> through the roof, you know. Um, but it will remain a, 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 re a relevant player within the party system. Um, and I think they will, like, be a, a typical 15% party, maybe even 20% party, uh, even uh, approaching to, to the results of the other parties, which will drop in, in, in acceptance and popularity. For example, the, the typical Volkspartei, CDU, CSU, SPD, which will drop, and the other smaller parties gaining ground, including the, including the newest party, AFD. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to finish with a question regarding uh, the, cons the geopol uh, geopolitical consequences of this wave of populism, because uh, we have experience, uh, for example, in uh, Spain and in the United States and in France and in Italy, uh, some kind of controversy regarding the role of Vladimir Putin and the Russians uh, maybe supporting these kind of movements. And it's interesting how uh, many of these right-wing populistic movements have moved from some kind of uh, Atlantic uh, uh, perspective or Atlantic uh, position to a more Slavophile uh, perspective. I mean, is, 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 is there a question in German public opinion with 
the role played by Russia and Putin concerning these parties? Yeah. Well, I think the former, um, um, the former tendency of populist right parties or some of that parties to, uh, to feel attracted by the West and USA and the like um, has been, I'm not quite sure about, it, but about that, but I have to, like, uh, to, to guess a little, um, has been driven mainly not only by the, by the um, appeal of the West, but also because it was, has been perceived as, like, yes, to cut a long way short, um, has, been, has been perceived as the opposite of immigration, and not immigration per se, but immigration from, from the Muslim world and so on, the un so, so goes the perception of the, of the unfree Muslim world, and I think that's, uh, that's more to do with that, with the fact of identity politics. And I don't know if uh, the, the appeal of, of Russia, of, of Putin, etc., uh, trace back to the um, dissolution of the appeal of the West. I'm not quite sure about that, because there are like little factions and disputes within the part family where to to orientate them, themselves. Um, but the the appeal of Russia and 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 Putin, especially, I think it has not much to do with with Russia itself, but with Putin and its, its policy, has to do with um, with authoritarianism, hmm. with the. Uh, with the relevance and the appeal of authoritarian solutions, solutions that neglect a compromise, that enforces themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, any enemies, be them domestically or, or on foreign policy, and to, to do what you think is best. It's not the, I think, um, to, 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 to give a metaphor or a picture, um, it's the acceptance that the stronger you are, the more right you have to, uh, to enforce yourself vis-a-vis uh, -vis others. Purely chauvinist attitude, of course, and I think it has to do with that and the authoritarian solutions, like the black-white solutions. You either enforce yourself or you lose. Either you do this or you do that. You, need, you don't need to, do, to compromise. And Putin, Putin is like, the, uh, like um, emblematic for that, I think, and that's why he's so attractive. I think there will be other politicians as well, um, right-wing populists in Europe will feel attracted to, but Putin has been the longest, uh, is in power for the longest time compared with all the other politicians. I think he's been elected president in 1999, I think the first time. Uh, that's why he is so um, capable of, of attracting these, uh, these people, I think. Tom, thank you so much for this very nice conversation. It was a pleasure, thank you. Thank you very much.